Welcome to Age of Noob, everyone, and to some massive updates that we need to cover for the upcoming changes for Age of Empires 4's Season 2 that's right around the corner. The developers have released a public preview for us to test out the new features, as well as the plethora of balance changes. There's a lot to cover here, so strap in and let's dive right in. All right, let's begin with the new features. As communicated a few months ago, you will finally be able to pick your color before you begin the game. I've already shared my opinion on how late some of these features were added to the game, but hey, it's here and it's working as intended. The colors that are available are blue, red, yellow, green, teal, purple, orange, and pink. More importantly, hotkeys also get their final major change that was long anticipated. Hence, players can now choose to move away from the grid system, and this comes with a few nuances. Let's take a deeper look. Under controls, you can now pick between the grid system and the fully remappable option. If you prefer the grid system and would like to keep things as is, then you don't have to change anything, as you'll still be able to access that view as before. If you're like me and want to revamp everything individually, you will now get 95% of that power. The reason why it's not 100% is due to the rigidity of the four construction menus. Now, we can still change the hotkeys for these four construction menus of Q, W, E, and R to anything we want, but the buildings within them cannot be moved. In other words, houses will always be in construction menu 1, and so will the lumber camp. If I set the construction menu to the hotkey of A, then both the house and the lumber camp have to start with A and then their corresponding individual key that you set for them. Is this the end of the world? Not really. I can live with this, and so can many other players. The level of customization that's available right now is finally very generous and should please most players' needs. We still need some minor updates such as select all military units without religious or naval units and so on, but I'm confident that these major final updates will be added at some point to fully wrap up hotkeys in this game. And yes, the fully remappable hotkeys do allow conflicts in their mappings, and you will be alerted as such. This is fantastic to map the same key for civilization-specific buildings, such as wooden fortresses, uvus, and so on, but obviously it goes without saying that you shouldn't map the same key for universally available buildings such as the house and the barracks. Another very requested feature, which is some sort of map veto system, is finally also being introduced, and it's very well designed. For quick play, players will be able to downvote 5 maps and 3 maps for ranked matchmaking. You will now see a map preference button on the bottom left, and the maps are divided very nicely at the top. Hence, if you just hate playing on water, you can simply select the naval icon on the top and downvote all the maps there. Maps are also further divided into elevation, choke point, river, open, and high resources to help you find the maps you hate with a passion easily. The way this works is also simple. The game will choose a map randomly that neither player has downvoted, so this should definitely help with the map dodging for smoother matchmaking gameplay. In case you're wondering, players still get the same amount of downvotes in team games as well, so if 8 players have collectively downvoted every single map in the game, then the maps with the least amount of downvotes will be selected for the game, which makes sense. Overall, kudos to the devs as this is very well designed and will be a great addition to the game in July. Moving on, the developers have added another official map called the Pit, and I think I really like it. There's a generous safe world line for players at the back of their initial TC, with the main neutral resources concentrated in the middle and the corners. It's quite symmetrical as well, and should be fun to play as it's not one-dimensional. Also, the developers have finally caved in after almost a year since the betas, and have provided us players even more zoom out. I think this zoom level should now satisfy most players, as you can see much more of the map without sacrificing much control. This is a very welcome change and should bring back some players who had this issue as a deal breaker. The camera angle is also slightly adjusted so that it's more top down, which in my opinion is a good change. Moving on, the developers have introduced a massive overhaul to the interaction between siege units and melee units. With the exception of villagers, melee units will now use their normal weapons instead of torches to attack siege units. Since torch damage was mostly the same across many units, the developers have introduced some balance changes around this. 1. Horsemen do get a plus 10 bonus damage against siege units. 2. Other torches no longer deal bonus damage versus siege. 3. And this is a big one, villager repair rate of siege units is nerfed to the ground, down to 5 HP per second from 20. 4. Ranged armor increased to 20 for all siege weapons, while bombard and cannon specifically get 30 ranged armor instead. 5. Siege works armor bonus increased from 3 to 10. And finally, the height of the projectiles for the trebuchets and the defensive cannons were reduced so they're easier to read and don't fly off screen. This is something that I mentioned before the game was even released in my trebuchet related video, so I'm glad the developers have finally addressed this clarity problem. Good stuff. Regarding individual balance changes, it's a long, long list, so I'll show them to you on screen right now and give you a quick summary instead. The raw HPs of every siege unit have been reduced significantly, but their armor is inversely increased to offset this change. Springles and other siege units bonus damage against other siege units were also nerfed as well. 
All in all, we'll have to wait and see how these changes play out, and I'm sure the developers will issue a hotfix if there's anything broken mid-patch. That was the siege rework, so let's now take a look at the general changes. Deer and sheep that block building foundations will move out of the way much quicker. Trade ships will no longer return additional gold, but would have the same amount of the gold it was trading. Shore and river fish have smaller hitboxes now to avoid docks destroying them easily. Villagers now prefer to automatically collect deer instead of berry bushes when building a mill next to both. And villagers will now go idle when they can no longer collect the same resource within a reasonable distance. This is to avoid very long distance wood chopping or mining when the original resource is exhausted. All of these are fantastic quality of life changes. Moving on to buildings, towers are getting a significant nerf as all of their emplacements are getting tuned down. Arrow slit emplacement bonus range is reduced to 1, sprinkled emplacement damage reduced from 60 to 40, and cannon emplacement damage decreased from 85 to 70. Also, buildings that only cost stone to build, such as stone walls and keeps, now cost stone to repair instead of wood, which is also a huge change. Furthermore, relic garrisoning on any building is now limited to only 3 relics. And finally, Stone Wall's construction HP start is reduced from 10% to 1%. This effectively kills any quick walling of any kind now, as your melee units should be able to torch it down immediately and break in. Regarding units, Spearmen do get a slight behavior update to make their bracing smoother. Green ears, which have been meaning to cover for a while now, get a nerf to tweak them down a bit. Horsemen get a big buff to their late game, as they now get an additional armor in the Castle and Imperial Age, and Monk's training time is reduced to 30 seconds. Another great set of changes that I don't think any player would oppose to. To wrap up the general changes section, a very nice change is also being introduced to team games. Landmark victory will only be triggered once all allied landmarks are destroyed. This means that the enemy rushing down one of your player's landmarks down won't immediately take out their entire army and production out of the game. This is a big change and should reduce the amount of cheese in team games overall. The projectile speeds of cannon-based siege units are also reduced for clarity reasons. Herbal Medicine receives a buff to both its cost and research time, and Siege Engineering gets a research speed buff down to 45 seconds from 60. Alright, the final section to cover is the civilization specific changes, so let's start with the Abbasids. The mill influence range is increased by one tile to help with the Golden Age mechanic. Spice Roads and Grand Bazaar bugs have been fixed, and other miscellaneous bugs have also been fixed and cleaned up. Overall, the Abbasids will remain relatively the same. The Chinese on the other hand get some big changes. First of all, the Fire Lancers are slightly buffed, but the developers mentioned that they have more plans for them in the future. Pyrotechnics only affects hand cannoneers now, so it's an overall nerf. That said, the cost of pyrotechnics is halved and reload drills is also slightly buffed to offset the previous changes. Granaries are also buffed in terms of cost and there are some landmark changes here as well. First, the Barbican of the Sun now has the ability to purchase the Springled and Cannon emplacements, which is great for late game scaling. Although the Great Wall Gatehouse loses its previous bonuses, it now gets a Nest of Bees emplacement as well as a plus 25% range damage bonus on stone walls. Spirit Way also gets an interesting change as it now houses Dynasty technologies which can be researched for half the cost and double the research speed. Furthermore, when a Dynasty unit dies on the battlefield, nearby units will receive a plus 20% attack speed and plus 20 health over 10 seconds. And finally, the Ming Dynasty bonus no longer increases the health of keeps, stone wall towers and outposts. Moving on to the Delhi Sultanate, they get an overall research speed buff for their Imperial Age technologies, as they will now cost 12 times the research time instead of the previous 15 times. That said, Boiling Oil, All Seeing Eye, Swiftness, Professional Scouts, and Herbal Medicine all require more time to research, while Survival Techniques get a buff instead. Apart from other minor bugs being fixed, the final change was made to the Dome of Faith, in which it was buffed to minus 40% cost and plus 50% research speed instead of the previous only 50% cost reduction. The English get an interesting change as their naval civilization bonus and unique technology are swapped. Shiprites is now renamed Admiralty and it now provides plus one range to all English combat ships. Inversely, the English now have a global discount to naval units of 10%. Furthermore, the Wingard Palace landmark has now two production options. Wingard Raiders will now spawn an army of three knights and three horsemen and the Wingard Raiders will spawn an army of three hand cannoneers and three crossbowmen. Both of these are fantastic as they provide amazing value and they're meant to be specialized to what you need at that stage of the game, instead of having a random AI army of one of each that has very little practical use. The Abbey of Memes gets yet another buff to its range, but I don't think this will make much of a difference. I still think the developers need to rethink this landmark to truly make it a viable alternative. Moving on to the French, the Royal Institute discount is increased from 20% to 30%, which honestly is very, very attractive now. 
Aggressive French players could very well begin choosing this landmark over the Guild Hall to get a big power spike over their opponents in the Castle Age. Furthermore, Red Palace default weapons was decreased from 3 to 2 Arbalests, and the bug of Chamber of Commerce giving no bonus to trade value instead of the proper plus 30% is now fixed. And finally, the French trade ship bonus is changed from plus 20% gold to plus 20% of all resources on trades. The Holy Roman Empire also gets a great set of changes. The Regnus Cathedral landmark now provides plus 100% gold from all capture relics instead of the plus 200% gold from two relics garrison within. It also is now a fully functional monastery. This basically means that the HRE players can now be more aggressive with their relics on other buildings and opens up their gameplay even more. One other nice change is that prelates will also inspire units when they start healing, which is great for more aggressive play. The Minework Palace landmark is buffed yet again, as its discount and research speed are also increased from 30% to 40%, which honestly is pretty good. It'll be interesting to see the viability of either landmark now. The Aachen Chapel landmark now accepts the drop-off of all resources, but I think this is mostly to farm around the landmark without the need of mills, which is still a pretty nice buff. Finally, a bug where Dark and Feudal Age Prelates only healing for 3.5 per second instead of the intended 7 was also fixed. Honestly, HRE gets some amazing changes that should make them a lot more fun to play now. The Mongols get a few changes, though there's nothing significant here in my opinion. Mangadize were slightly buffed due to a previous attack rate issue, the Kurultai gets a minor buff for healing and dropping the need to have the Khan around, and some other minor miscellaneous changes were implemented. Overall, the Mongols should feel relatively the same. And finally, the Rus. Similar to the Mangadai, the Horse Archers also get a minor buff due to some back-end changes. The Spaskaya Tower landmark now unlocks stone walls, so the Rus can now potentially be more protected in the late game. I still believe this won't be enough to sway players away from high armory in most situations. The Kremlin also gets a buff in its influence range, weapon range, and garrison error range. Furthermore, the aura indicator on the high trade house to represent the correct tree counting range was fixed, as the visual is now an accurate representation of what trees are being counted by the landmark. And finally, some other minor changes were made to the Laudia ships as well. Well, that's all you need to know about the upcoming changes in Season 2 for Age of Empires 4. This was a really long patch to cover, but I did my best to summarize everything into a short, digestible video for you folks. That said, if you've been waiting to get back into the game, this patch is it. Being able to pick colors, full hotkey customization, bug fixes, more balance changes, more ranked modes and mod support finally bring the game to a state where you can recommend your friends to give the game another shot. I'm excited to see how the game will further evolve from here and how it will perform in the upcoming Red Bull Wololo tournament. And if you'd like to see more of this type of AOE content, be sure to like and subscribe to not miss out on future videos. As always, thanks for watching everyone and see you all in the next one.